Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that being left high and dry is actually a good thing, at least if you're a telescope, especially for something called ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. And this is a telescope you've probably never heard about. It's located on the 5,000 meter high Chinatour Plateau in the Chilean Andes. And one of the driest parts of the planet, in fact, they believe there was no rainfall there at all for 400 years. And this thing that you've never heard of has 66 high-precision antennas with radio dishes that weigh about 100 tons each. And since 2013, we've been using this to study light from some of the coldest objects in the universe. This is molecular gas and dust. It has a wavelength of light around a millimeter between infrared light and radio waves. And we can look at things that we've never seen in the entire history of humanity and see very distant light that's been shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. In order to do something like this, it took thousands of scientists and engineers from around the world more than a decade of work, and it's a collaboration from four continents and is the largest ground-based astronomical project in existence. And the reason I'm talking with you about this is because, as you know, if you're a long-time listener, I like to foreshadow what we're going to talk about in the show. But also, just think about the amount of science and technology that happened on that and the fact that unless you're a space geek, this is totally going by without you knowing about it. You ever think about what else is going on in the world of technology and of innovation that's completely outside your knowledge but is something that would have been impossible even if everyone in the world had put their brains together to do this even 50 years ago. That's an example of how fast things are changing. And it's not just in space. It's changing in everything we do as human beings. And I'm pretty darned excited about it. And so is today's guest. Today's guest is Anushe Ansari. She grew up in Iran and lived through the Iranian Revolution in the 1970s and the war in the 80s and came to the U.S. at age 16, became a really successful serial entrepreneur and active proponent of world-changing technologies. And right now, she's co-founder and CEO of Prodia Systems, which is an Internet of Things technology company. But you might have heard of her because on September 18th, 2006, the day her company launched, she herself literally launched into space for 11 days. And that was the accomplishment of a childhood dream. She's the first female private space explorer, the first astronaut of Iranian descent, the first Muslim woman in space, and the fourth private explorer to visit space. Anusha, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. It's great to be part of the show. You have a mantra and business phrase that you've talked about, and you say, imagine, be the change, inspire. Where did that come from? Well, actually, this is what I wrote uh, on top of the patch that I designed when I went to space station. And it sort of uh, describes the three phases of my life uh, and uh, how I feel like most people should live their life. Um, The first part of of our lives is to use the most precious gift we have is the gift of imagination. So we can imagine different worlds, we can imagine a different life, we can imagine uh, how we want to live our life. And and basically, that's how we are set on a path that will determine which direction we take, what we get involved with, and what excites us, what we want to learn. And it's a big part of how the rest of our world and uh, the rest of our life starts to shape up. And then uh, after that, uh, you know, Be The Change basically describes um, a big part of my personality. I'm one of those people who, when I see a problem, I want to basically do something about it. So I don't complain about problems. I try to find a solution for them. Maybe it's my engineering background and training in problem solving. But, um, you know, I believe that if something is important enough to us, then uh, we cannot just leave it to others to fix it. And it's up to us to um, change it. So it came from a famous uh, quote by Gandhi, be the change you want to see in the world. 
And then the last part is when you are lucky enough, fortunate enough to be able to accomplish uh, these things in your life and be able to accomplish maybe great tasks in your life, especially and overcome challenges. And uh, you need to tell your story. You need to inspire others to uh, help them see that uh, there's always uh, the, a light at the end of the tunnel. There is always a way to make the impossible possible. There's always someone out there that will help you hold your hand and get you through the difficult times. And that's the part uh, about inspiration and something I try to do a lot of now. When we first met, it was at the 10th anniversary of the Ansari uh, X Prize, uh, which was hosted by Peter Diamandis. Uh, this was uh, the, the prize of $10 million that was given for the first private space travel. It's the first company that could send something into orbit and bring it back uh, that changed the face of space travel now. That's why we have companies like SpaceX and Richard Branson's initiative. and. Uh, we got to chat for a little while then, and I was particularly impressed because Peter came to you and said, I sort of made this commitment that I'm going to give this $10 million, and it's not funded yet. I need help funding all of these university teams who are working on radically affordable space travel. And you said, sure, I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, walk me through what made you decide to do that. So uh, it goes back to also my uh, passion for space and space travel. I uh, had uh, dreamed about going to space and being an astronaut since I was very young uh, in Iran growing up. And, uh, you know, as I came to U.S. and, uh, you know, couldn't find the Starfleet Academy to sign up uh, for and and go to space, um, I realized that, uh, you know, this is something, a dream that I have to put on hold, which I did, went to school, became an engineer, became an entrepreneur. So sort of my life took a different path, but my passion for space was there and never went away and, if anything, just grew. So um, my uh, entrepreneurial activities was always also a way for me to uh, fund um, and find a way to go to space. And uh, when um, we sold our company, um, my husband and my brother-in-law were um, my co-founders and my, uh, in basically we do all these businesses together. And, um, and when we sold the company, um, the first thing I did is I took some time off and I said, okay, I want to go pursue this dream and see how I can make it happen. And I had done some interviews and Peter had read about them. And, and uh, in the interviews, I talked about my desire to do a suborbital flight and an orbital flight. So he got excited and it's like, okay, apparently by that time he had knocked on 150 other doors, big companies, CEOs, uh, philanthropists, and no one had uh, agreed to fund it because they all thought it's a crazy idea. So he, um, he came to us and... Uh, we met, and when I heard his idea, you know, I'm like, hmm, this makes sense. It's a sound investment decision because basically you're only paying someone after they demonstrate that it works and it, they fly to space. And, and uh, you know, deep down, I believe that, you know, if I ever would go to space, it would be through a private space uh, um, endeavor and not through government. So I, um, you know, I, I immediately got really, first of all, uh, fascinated by uh, Peter's passion, which I shared, and and uh, his approach to solving this problem. And I felt that, you know, this is a partnership that can last forever and that can help me get to where I want to go. And, and um, basically, after, uh, I don't know, a half a day or so of just getting all the data from him, we decided that, uh, you know, we want to be partner of XPRIZE and Peter in this uh, endeavor, and we became the title sponsors. We didn't announce it until a while after this conversation, but um, but it, we became partner immediately, and and I'm so happy because it's been a blessing to be part of the XPRIZE Foundation. For me. It's pretty unusual for, but uh, well, I'm just going to sort of say it. I, this is stereotypical, <laughs> but I've got two two kids. Uh, my son's eight, or he just turned nine, and my daughter's 11. 
And I've been telling them both a, a space story for the past four years, the, this thing. And it's to teach them about technology and about how society works and all. And um, after this, my son says, Daddy, I want to be a space engineer when I grow up. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. And my daughter says, I want to be an artist when I grow up. Okay. Now, these are stereotypes, but this is actually what my kids did. And it's not like they don't get a little bit of pushing for, for STEM and engineering. Um, but it's much more common for men to say, I want to be an astronaut than it is for women. What, especially at the, the age when we were both younger, um, it, it was, it's very unusual. What made you such a, a space aficionado as a young child? I mean, it's just, it's unusual. What made you break the stereotype? Well, I, I don't have any scientific reason for it, but I can tell you that, you know, I, as you mentioned, I was born in Iran and grew up in Iran. And uh, summer nights, you know, back then we didn't have iPads and iPhones and, and none of these electronics. So um, summer nights, uh, because we didn't have air conditioning, uh, I would sleep outside. And, you know, as I was uh, laying in my bed, I would look at the night skies. And, uh, you know, again, because you don't have all these distractions and electronics, I guess, your imagination is very powerful. So I would, you know, try to make up all these stories about what's out there. And I would look at the, those stars and try to understand how far they are, what they're made of, if there is, uh, you know, another girl like me out there looking back at me and thinking about the same things and if there are other worlds. And, and it was, you know, basically something that fascinated me grab my attention and uh, the more I looked at the night skies and the stars the more I wanted to know about them I wanted to go touch them I wanted to fly up to them and uh, that was the beginning of uh, my interest in math science and uh, astronomy and trying to learn more uh, as I started learning to read uh, one of the first books that I read uh, at a young age was the, um, the Little Prince and that story fascinated me and I identified with the little prince and I wanted to fly to space again and I was adamant that there are aliens. Uh, I became an avid Star Trek uh, fan and watched Star Trek in Iran growing up and, and uh, would always go back on that balcony and look out and pray for aliens to come and take me away <laughs> so I could go explore. This curiosity, I think, uh, was the, at the base of my uh, desire to learn about space, to go to space, to to this day, to go and explore and find out what's out there. Because I feel like the more I know about what's out there and how our world came to be, um, the more I learn about myself and my role in it, and my place in it. And um, that's why I love cosmology. I love the study of how the universe started, how it will end. If there is a start or an end, uh, you know, all these theories of that. Uh, that's beautiful. So core curiosity got you there. I, I believe so. And and sometimes I feel like as parents, I don't have kids, so <laughs> I don't want to be judgmental. But I think as parents, um, you, somehow we're more protective of our girls than we are our boys. And through our uh, protective lens, we sort of try we stop them from risking things. We don't want them to fall down. We don't want them to climb the tree. We don't want them to do a lot of things. And without knowing, we limit their field of exploration and imagination. And, and sometimes that's what leads them to, you know, not pursue things that is dangerous and risky and, and uh, uh, potentially, uh, I guess, you know, requires that type of um, you know, risk taking. Uh, I, I did a talk for a group of um, kindergartners um, and I uh, arrived with my uh, astronaut training suit on and they all gathered around me. They were excited and they're like, you know, but, but you're an astronaut? I'm like, yes, I'm an astronaut, especially the girls. And they're like, but you're, you're too short and you're you're not big and you're not this. And I'm like, you don't need to be big and strong to go to space. You know, everything is weightless in space. You just and Not only that, it takes less rocket fuel for you to go to space when you're like. <laughs> but somehow with the stories of the right stuff and 
big macho men being the face of um, the early space, um, you know, uh, travels, that this whole notion has stayed with, especially girls that, you know, maybe you have to be a very strong, big person to go to space and I'm too weak or, or too small to, to do anything like that. I don't know, these all could play a role in people even thinking about possibility of going to space. What did your parents do that encouraged you to take risks? I think the most important thing is they left me alone. <laughs> they, they just let me do a lot of things. Of course, nothing that would put me in danger, but um, I actually, my parents were not scientists or engineers. Um, and uh, my father was in sales and marketing. Um, my mom uh, worked at a university uh, in the administrative office. And um, so for me, it was, um, you know, it was just experimentation. Uh, and I love books. So the more books I read, um, the more I wanted to know and uh, the more I get curious about other people's lives and where they lived. And uh, uh, so I think curiosity was uh, a big part of, again, um, what led me down this path. And my parents just, I think they got tired of all the times that I asked why and why, why this and why that, why, why is this this way? And, and my mom would just say, go play. And I would go play outside and, and um, basically, I felt like, you know, the world is uh, waiting for me to discover it. What made you start a company uh, and what did you do to make it so successful that you could afford to fund <laughs> your space travel? Well, it all was by a chance, to be honest with you. Um, I met my uh, brother-in-law at school. We went to, to university together. Through him, I got introduced to his brother, later became my husband. And so um, we sort of all are in this technology and, and telecommunication business back then. And uh, the company we worked for um, left um, Virginia area where we lived and we uh, didn't want to move. So we left the company and started uh, our own consulting practices. We each did consulting on our own for a while. And then uh, we decided to join our forces and, and uh, launch our first company. And uh, it was still a along the same line because we were doing consulting. We found a need for a lot of these companies to better understand new and upcoming technologies and how it could help them launch new services and generate new, new revenue. So we started helping them with these technology questions. And then soon enough, we found that we, we give them the answer, but they just, you know, they're too big sometimes to execute on those plans we gave them. So instead of just consulting for them and telling them what to do, we said, well, what if we built this for you? Will you buy it from us? And, mm -hmm. and then they said, yeah, well, we said, OK, let's go do this. So we went and sold every uh, stock we had, we put our credit cards together, we sold everything we had, and we started our first company, started building these software solutions uh, for the telecom industry, and we grew from there. And to be honest with you, if you had asked me back then if I had any idea of how big it would get and, and how successful, um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to tell you back then. And uh, for us, it was just a business and we were running and growing our business. And uh, eventually, um, I remember uh, clearly uh, one day I was watching um, CNN and they were talking about Dennis Tito. So Dennis Tito was the first uh, person who flew as a private astronaut to space station. And they were talking about the controversies between NASA and the Russian Space Agency. And I just tuned into that and I'm like, okay, well, if nothing else works, that's one way I could go to space. Seems like I can buy a ticket. And, um, and of course, I knew I don't have the money to buy the ticket. And the company was quite small back then and, and still we were bootstrapping. So it became a motivation for me because I'm like, okay, all I need to do is figure out a way how we can make this company big enough so I can actually afford to buy this ticket and uh, 
So it was an inspiration for me to be able to uh, find ways to even scale up and grow the company further than we had already and uh, eventually paid off. So your dream of traveling to space was part of what motivated you to grow your company? Absolutely. It's, it's been a constant theme in my life. I think it influences uh, everything I do. Uh, before going to space, it influenced the steps I took that would get me closer to that dream. And then after I have experienced being in space and seeing our world from up there, it has influenced me and continues to influence everything I do and, and uh, the work I take on and how I prioritize my life. How did it feel after you came back from space? I mean, you, it, you've just achieved your life's dream. And what happened to you psychologically after you landed? You're like, I'm done? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, as uh, you, uh, you know, you, you said, you said it well, it was, uh, a uh, accomplishment of a life dream and I was about uh, I was only 40 years old back then and I uh, basically had looked uh, to this big goal in front of me all of my life and there I was in uh, you know in the in Astana in Kazakhstan sitting uh, in a chair after they took me out of the rocket and the sun was coming up and I'm thinking to myself, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> and it was hard. I was depressed. It was a very difficult transition for two reasons. One was because I felt like this biggest, most important thing in my uh, life was now done. And uh, even though I had an amazing experience and I wanted to go back, I wasn't sure if I would be able to and when would that happen. And then um, the next thing was because I had this, extraordinary experience and you know coming back I felt like you know everyone around me sleepwalking and and they don't understand me and they don't understand what I've seen and I wanted to shake them up and say you know just do you realize where you're living and you know how you're part of this much bigger universe and it, it felt like, you know, I, I became an alien. And um, so it was a process of reintegration into the real world. What did you decide to do next to motivate yourself? So, so you've had this motivation for 40 years, or at least maybe 35 of them. And you're sitting there in the chair. How did you get reinvigorated? Did, did you pick another big thing, you know, first to Mars, or <laughs> you switch gears? So what, what's motivating you today? So, um, you know, first of all, I knew that uh, it, it's not the end of my space endeavors, and I wanted to continue because I felt like the experience I just had is something that anyone who wants to should be able to experience because this is life-altering. Um, so I knew I would be part of that whole movement. And also, um, you know, I had uh, done this uh, blog from space. So I was the first blogger from space. And, uh, you know, I never had written a single th thing that was published before that. And um, the blogs became very popular. I was just writing about what I did every day. To me, it was ordinary tasks that becomes funny and interesting when you're in space. And um, and I would write also about my emotions and thoughts uh, as I was in, in the space station. And uh, it became very popular. So in the first two months of uh, this blog, we had about, I guess, 20 million uh, visitors. And uh, part of that was that people from all over the world was writing back to me and and telling me how the story had inspired them and people from remote places of Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, people from a lot of the um, uh, developing countries where, um, you know, women don't have a big chance of advancement. And so they were all writing to me and saying that, you know, just hearing about you and, and your story is giving us hope uh, that, you know, even though it may seem impossible, that there is a way and that uh, we, we are pursuing our dream and we're going after our dream. Not that everyone wanted to go to space, but they had other dreams of their own. But 
um, in their environment and everyday life, those dreams were either shattered by the society or uh, their belief system that it's impossible to do them. And I had given them hope to change that. And to me, that was beautiful. And, and I didn't know at the beginning what to do about it, but I felt like, you know, I was uh, very lucky and this gift was given to me, um, the gift of going to space and being able to experience what I did. And I have to find a way to translate that and inspire others. So um, help uh, tell my story in a better way, um, tell it to people who need it the most and, and basically give people hope and inspire them to go after their own dreams. So I do a lot of that these days through different media talks, school visits, um, you know, speaking engagements. I did uh, a memoir. I published my book, My Dream of Stars, um, uh, which uh, basically tells my entire story from uh, when I was born to my um, endeavor to International Space Station. And uh, I collaborate with a lot of nonprofits now to help um, you know, a lot of different parts of the society, the disadvantaged parts of the society to be able to, um, you know, be hopeful about the future and to go and accomplish big things and uh, especially focused on women and youth because I think that's where uh, a lot of hidden potential energy is there that we can unleash for good. So you switched gears from pursuing actually going to space to pursuing the idea of inspiring others. What do you believe about human potential? If people are inspired, what are we actually capable of? And what happens if, if, if say you fail at your goal of inspiring people? Like what, why does it matter? So I think, um, you know, human potential is almost infinite. I don't think, uh, we know what we're capable of. I don't think um, there's any single person that we can say has reached 100% of their full potential out there. So as we accomplish more, I think we just learn that we could do more and, and we, if we push ourselves. But it's, it's difficult. It's something that requires a lot of hard work, discipline, focus, concentration, and those only come with motivation. So I think the only way we can reach those potentials is when we're doing something that excites us because that energy comes from deep inside of us, and that energy that allows us to, you know, overcome failures because, you know, when you want to do something big and important, you're bound to fail. And, you know, sometimes failing and failing again and again and again, it hurts. It, it shatters your confidence. It may uh, physically harm you. It, it's, it's difficult. So uh, you have to really feel strong enough about what you're pursuing to be able to find the energy to get up again and, and continue to take another step. And if you fall again, to get up again and take another step. And, um, and that's why I think um, I heard someone call it grit. So people who are able to reach far and do difficult things have this thing in them that they sort of become thick skinned <laughs> and they, uh, they can stand a lot of uh, failures, negative thoughts, negative, um, you know, comments about people, you know, about them from people around or from society and just focus, become single, focused on their goal and on their passion and desire and only see um, that that will get them closer to uh, their goal. And uh, it's, it's a rare thing to find, to be honest with you. Uh, and, uh, but once you're there, it's, it's a blissful life. I think it's a, f a fulfilling life that you live because even though you may be broken and tired and full of scars when you get there and accomplish something, big, um, you can look back at your life and say, I have no regret. And I think to me, uh, that's wonderful to be able to look back and say, hmm, I, I did whatever I wanted to do. 
I failed at some things, I succeeded at, at others, but I have no regrets. And I think that would be a uh, life well lived. Does that describe you now? It does. Uh, I think it's a really good description of my life so far. I failed at many things. I'm not perfect at all. I, uh, But every time I have done something that was meaningful to me, that was something that I felt deeply passionate about, uh, I always, I don't get tired. Uh, time stops, you know, if I'm not eating, if I'm not sleeping. Uh, as long as I'm working on that thing that excites me, as long as I'm working with people around me who are excited about the same thing, I just, uh, you know, won't even notice the passage of time. And, and I would uh, go through any fire and any mountain and any obstacle to, to get there. What are you doing now to tap into your human potential? You believe it's unlimited, so you've already done quite a few things, but what else is on your plate? A lot, actually. <laughs> In ways um, too much. I am, uh, you know, continuously uh, working and very, very actively collaborating with XPRIZE. Um, I am uh, running uh, my company and uh, uh through that, I have also been exposed to, um, you know, throughout my career, I've been exposed to technology and and see how technology is transforming everyday lives and is impacting us. But uh, I also feel fortunate that I'm part of an elite group of people who uh, are able to know and understand and acknowledge uh, how these exponential technologies are impacting our world and uh, I feel like a very large majority of the population still either don't know it, don't understand it fully or just are completely uh, oblivious about it and uh, I think it is important to have uh, everyone involved in deciding how these technologies will evolve and change our lives because they're moving so fast that we can't wait and debate about it, you know, 10 years down the line, because at that time, you know, it would be too late. And this is a very exciting and also very critical time in, you know, taking steps toward making sure these technologies that are always tools are used to bring abundance, to bring a better future for everyone and not just a small group of people. I interviewed uh, Peter Diamandis about exponential technologies and how the things that we saw over the past five years we're likely to see over the next six months repeated and how the speed of changes is just rapid and amazing right now. And it's one of the reasons I'm just so excited to be alive at this time because the potential we have is, is great. But the potential to do great harm is also there. Uh, so the more power you have, the more bad things you can do or the more good things you can do. What are you doing uh, to make sure that the exponential technologies that you're supporting are actually doing good things instead of bad things? So I think um, collaboration is very important. So I am uh, working with XPRIZE and a few other organizations and uh, nonprofits to create a way for um, collaborative effort between the teams that are the most advanced teams in some of these areas. And, um, you know, whether it's uh, artificial intelligence, um, whether it's advancement in CRISPR and uh, DNA sequencing or editing, uh, or in robotics, uh, a, a lot of these different areas that will have a big impact on our lives. And uh, by, um, you know, collaborating between different countries, different governments, different agencies, uh, sharing findings, sharing data, creating uh, a common uh, sort of principles, if you would, on how we want to push these technologies um, you know, working with standard bodies. Uh, we had just uh, XPRIZE uh, co-hosted a conference on AI for good. 
and focusing on how these technologies can be used for good and then um, they would be doing great business but also solving real problems in the world and um, I think starting this dialogue and conversation in this fashion would be a first step toward that and very important step. What is the single most exponential technology that has you excited and interested and, and just paying attention? To be honest with you, I think artificial intelligence has been very exciting to me, scary and exciting at the same time, uh, because it touches everything. It will transform every aspect of health, uh, uh, you know, work, life, governments, uh, everything we do, um, research in every direction. So I think it will become embedded in everything. And uh, so being able to, and, and you know, you've talked to Peter, so with Moore's Law and how this is advancing and um, how our computing power and the cost of computing is dropping. All of these deals will make this type of technologies affordable and accessible to everyone, but um, it also in the hands of people who really don't understand the power of it. Um, it can be destructive. It can get out of hand. It can get out of hand for humanity when, you know, the entire human race is, um, uh, brain power can be summed up in one computer chip. Um, you know, it, the next step from there is it will go beyond what we can understand. And we already see some early experiments with AI where uh, we've started some experiments and then after a few months, we sort of, it's evolving on its own. And with machine learning, we don't even understand how it's evolving. We can't explain how it's evolving. We're fascinated by it. We're studying it, but um, we sort of don't control it anymore. And I, I'm not saying these things to say that we should be scared of it, but I think, you know, we should be um, careful with it. It's like a virus where, you know, you can study the virus and, you know, you can use it to create uh, medicine and use it for a cure, but if it gets out of hand and it spreads without control, it may also cause a lot of damage. So we need to set some, um, you know, ground rules, collaborate together to make sure those ground rules are followed to allow us to at least better understand it before we decide what we need to do. Uh, because we're not even at the stage we can say what we need to do or should do. Do you think Elon Musk is right in his assessment of the dangers of AI? I think um, any technology including and most importantly exponential technologies can be used for good or for bad. We should be scared of every technology and we should be hopeful of every technology. Technology on its own is not good or bad, it's just a tool. How we use it is what determines, you know, whether we, uh, you know, whether it will do good or harm. So I think, you know, Elon's, you know, view of uh, a doom and gloom world, world while possible is not the only outcome but uh, and it can be the reverse I mean I can sit here and recite thousands of ways AI has helped and will continue to help in the medical field for example it has been amazing and it has uh, already advanced to uh, be able to diagnose than doctors or radiologists can. Uh, so, you know, we can't just, first of all, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, that's not possible. And two, you know, when there is good possibility, why not concentrate on that? So instead of being scared of it, we just need to accept it as a tool and use it as, as such for better uses. I studied uh, early artificial intelligence in my undergraduate degree. And it, it has such great promise, but you can certainly use it for, for bad things. And there's examples of technology being used uh, for very bad things since the advent of technology. A lot of people don't know, you know one of the first uses of uh, computer sorting algorithms was in World War II to figure out who came from which genetic heritage, <laughs> things like that. Uh, that was actually powered by IBM. Uh, and uh, that that's an incredibly bad use of technology. But... 
uh, for all of that, there's been huge good use of technology. So I, I'm not sure it'll be either all good or all bad, but I, I know it's happening. And I'm, I'm pleased that you're working on the idea of how do we use AI for good as, as part of what you're doing with ex- exponential technologies, uh, you know, post your, your space flight and all that. Here's a question for you, though. Given that you're more familiar with uh, some of these technologies like CRISPR than the average, uh, the average person, I want to take it down to you personally. How long do you think you're going to live? So it's an interesting question, but I need to split it. Is how long do I want to live or how long can I live? <laughs> so it's, it's different. Yes. So I think we're, again, in, in a very interesting time. Uh, I think Peter calls it the escape velocity, the health escape velocity. Uh, so there's possibility yeah. of if we take good care of ourselves that we can live as, you know, maybe twice or three times the normal life expectancy of uh, average people right now at my age. Um, at, so right now uh, where we live, so maybe two, three hundred years. But um, I don't know if I want to live that long, to be honest with you. Um, it, it all depends on how fulfilling life is. And I, uh, I believe in life of meaning. So as long as there's meaning in life, um, you know, I would want to live. I uh, I think one of our biggest dilemmas in the future won't be how we overcome uh, famine or, you know, um, you look at um, future of work for people and how AI and robotics will basically take over a lot of the jobs we have. So as human beings, I think we need to worry about if we're not, if we don't have to work, if we don't have to do anything, but we just live our lives and, you know, we have all the basic needs that we want, how would we live our life? We would wake up in the morning and what would we do? And I can think of a lot of things I would do, but I, I'm, I would be curious to see billions of people who don't have to work anymore and they wake up every morning. What would they spend their days on? So I think it's interesting ethical um, questions and interesting meaning and life questions, more philosophical questions, are what I think we need to think about when we talk about longevity. Um, so, so physically, yeah, I think we can live very long lives. So you're worried about being bored? Being bored, yeah. Okay, so you want to live as long as you can if you're not bored. Yeah, if I can go explore other galaxies. <laughs> <laughs> then I want to live forever because I would be just seeing and exploring new places. Um, but if I'm not able to do that for whatever reason, um, then I don't know. I don't know how long I would want to live. Do you think we're going to be able to explore other galaxies or even other planets without substantially hacking our own biology? No, we definitely need to do that. I mean, you know, the closest galaxies couple of light years away and, um, and uh, I, I think we, uh, we definitely need to either uh, through cryogenics or other ways uh, be able to extend our life to be able to really go beyond our uh, solar system. Um, I, I know virtual reality and robotics can allow us to virtually visit other worlds, um, but I don't know, I'm still a Star Trek fan, so I want to go there personally and, and experience <laughs> it uh, myself. Um, so I think we definitely need to, uh, you know, find different ways for, for our body to sustain space travel and living in space. And to be honest with you, you know, throughout history, we've evolved. Our bodies have evolved. So perhaps if we really become space faring species, our bodies will evolve to make us more, um, you know, more suitable for long-term space exposure and living in space. Do you think that it's ethical or a good idea for us to cause our bodies to evolve to be useful in space? Yeah, I, I would do it. I would do it. I, mean, I think uh, there may be implants, there may be ways of training our body. I mean, you know, if you want to go to an extreme place if you're as you know 
athlete or explorer and you want to go to an extreme place, you train your body to be able to sustain, uh, you know, in low oxygen levels or high altitudes and different weights. So I think it's not any different than that. I, as long as, you know, you're doing that, not forcing others to do it, but if you're making decisions for your own body, I believe that every person is responsible and in charge of their own body. I, uh, I, I believe that some of the things that we're doing to allow astronauts to survive in space are going to have huge implications for people who don't go to space. So I'm, I'm watching that very, uh, very well, both in terms of cognitive function, uh, longevity, uh, resilience, and all that, because we think running a marathon is an extreme human performance thing. I think staying in space for six months <laughs> is far more extreme. Uh, and if you look at the health results from astronauts who do that, it's not particularly promising right now. So there's, there's some core human engineering required there. Well, and that's one of the exponential things that can happen. So Dave, I'm going to ask you a question. It may not sure. be um, traditional for your podcast, but uh, what if we're at a point where we can, of course, back up our consciousness or mind, whatever you want to call it, and since uh, our bodies are just biological carbon prints, we can print another body uh, and just continue hopping, body hopping. So you're still you in a way, but your body is just another, you know, sort of, you know, piece of carbon suit, I guess, that your consciousness, and you know, can hop. A sleeve, as they a would sleeve. call it. Also yes, yes, actually. Yeah, exactly. Would you do that? Would do, Would you think of that as a possibility for future, for space travel, for whatever, for longevity? I, I'm open to the idea, but I've also spent enough time in uh, Tibet and with shamans and all that. And all of those people are saying that's pretty much already the case. <laughs> that's a good way right. of looking at it. Re <laughs> reincarnation. <laughs> So uh, I, I don't know. Right. So I, I don't really know if, if that's the case or not, but I, I sure know a lot of very smart, well-studied people in thousands of years of literature that are saying, well, reincarnation happens and I've seen some things I can't explain. So if that is the case, maybe we'll figure it out using things like big data mm -hmm. and actually finding evidence of this by combing through things we've never been able to look at before. So if, if it's the fact that ah, when you die, you come back anyway, well, hey, Problems already solved. We just didn't notice. But on the other hand, until I'm certain of that, yeah, you can bet your ass. I am going to back myself up. I don't understand why anyone wouldn't want to do yeah. that. Uh, and because even if whatever gets put into a new body isn't exactly the same as me, if what I think I'm doing and who I am is is worthy, uh, then why wouldn't I do that? As a matter of fact, why wouldn't I do that right now so I could have another sort of clone of me helping out on some of the projects I'm working on, right? I, I could use three or four of myself. So I don't know if I'd like them, but I, I mean, like, if we're going to think about that sort of stuff, why wait till you're dead to do it? Right? No, I agree. I, I think that I, I do believe it's a possibility and an, an interesting one because um, the difference between this and, and reincarnation is that when you reincarnate, you sort of start from the beginning. So you hit the reset button. But if you're doing it in a controlled way this way, then you're just you're continuing on, so you can go further because your knowledge base is, you know, doesn't get reset every time you change bodies. In the the historical or spiritual context of that, they, they have a name for controlled reincarnation. Uh -huh. They call it fully enlightened. Ah. So I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to sign up on that path Stop. while simultaneously <laughs> looking at the engineering path. Like I'll, I'll work on both <laughs> at the same time. And I think as a as a fully functioning, uh, scientifically based human being, uh, uh, they, they have this technology idea, a redundant array of inexpensive <laughs> pieces of technology. I'll try both, right? Like, like it's okay to have two paths exactly. and uh, fault tolerant systems. We'll put it that way. Uh, that, I like that's my that. take on yeah. it. Well, you know, in, in technology, we always have backups and backups. Right. Sounds good to me. So I'll work on the full enlightenment while I'm working on a backup strategy along the way in case I don't get that one right. Right. <laughs> cool. <laughs> cool. That was a fascinating question. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. I have one, one more question for sure. you. If someone came to you tomorrow and they said, I want to perform better at everything I do as a human being. Um, 
what are your three most important pieces of advice based on your entire life's experience? So give me the three most important things to kick ass at everything that I do. That's a tough question. Hmm. Advice that will help you do everything you do better. So I think and something at the top of everything um, is empathy. Uh, I think for you to be better at everything, you need to better understand others around you because you measure everything uh, comparing yourself to others. So understanding them will help you. Uh, so empathy, I would say, it's important. The other thing I would say, um, really finding a way to... Um, to reach inside to that source of energy inside, you may want to call it hope. Whatever it's inside that really drives you and understand it, understand what drives you because you cannot be better at something that's not important to you. To, 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 to align yourself with what's important to you, with what you're hopeful about, that what you know makes you get up in the morning. So that would be the second thing. And the third thing is that be patient because important big things require a lot of trial and error and practice and doing it over and over again and failing and doing better next time. So patience. Yeah, and patience. Um, beautiful. Uh, those are uh, fantastic things that didn't have anything to do with, you know, <laughs> using artificial intelligence or uh, have, you know, having even that big dream like that, but, but those are things that drive uh, human performance. And if you don't have those things, I don't think you can achieve, uh, the other things that, that are important in your life. So th thank you for, for sharing that. And you've, you've definitely learned a few things along your path, which, you know, a very successful entrepreneur, uh, space flight, and now being an inspiration to uh, millions of people. Uh, I'd, I'd like to think you'd learn some things along the way that are worth sharing. So th thank you for sharing that. Thank you. This was my pleasure. And I think those things will help you figure out how to use the technology because the technology to me is a given. It's like how you use it. So those things will help you to use them in the right way to help you. Uh, I fully agree. If people would like to find out more about your work, uh, you have all sorts of different projects you're working on. Is the best website Anusha uh, Ansari.com? I'll spell that for people if that's the right website. Sure. Is that sort of the. Yeah, you, you can find a lot of information and links on that website or um, XPRIZE or simply Google my name and I think a whole bunch of things about my talks and my different work comes up. But uh, yeah. Anyway. That, that might be the, the best way to do it. Sure. So, and I have a Twitter account that I talk about some of my work. And okay, so if people Google Ansari, they'll find you, A-N-S-A-R-I? Yeah, Anusha Ansari, because there are lots of Ansaris. So I oh, there are lots of Ansaris. Okay, cool. And your first name for people who are driving or who don't look at the show notes, it's A-N-O-U-S-H-E-H. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being on Bulletproof Radio, and have an awesome day. Thank you so much for having me, and I had lots of fun. If you liked today's episode, you know what to do. Head on over to Google and check out some of the things we talked about today. There's so much inspiration that you can find when you look at someone who's actually gone to space, who set a goal as a child, achieved it by the time she was 40, and took that and now is working to inspire millions of people and to make sure we do the right things with technology. Uh, there's, it's a fascinating story and there's just a, a lot of, of things that will make you wake up in the morning and say, you know, I thought I was doing something really big, but I was thinking really small. And if that's one thing you get from listening to Bulletproof Radio, that there's probably a lot more potential inside of you than you thought there was. And when you find it, you can probably do more things to change the world. And that's what this is all about. Thanks for listening. 